would be a... Uh... So uh, there's, a, there's actually a Monty Python skit. Monty Python, the meaning of life, I think, about working on a I, I looked it up just before I came down here. <laughs> I was going to show it to you. It is awfully bloody. So, go on YouTube, search for Monty Python organ donor. Okay, so this is kind of terrifying. Well, so let, let's, let me actually, let's take a poll on this. I asked you whether it would be more force a healthy individual to give up their organs and die in order to save five other people who need the organs to live. But maybe I, will, I think I want to rephrase this a little bit. Instead of this question, I, 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 I want to ask, um, so I just proposed what kind of social policy where Albany Med gets to send out ambulances to collect people who would be a match for multiple organ donations. Um, and I guess what I really want to ask is whether you would support that policy. So let's say yes is A, no is B for the policy of sending out, passing a law or whatever, that sends out um, an ambulance, you know, probably protected by armed guards to collect people who would then be killed in order to save others. So let's take a poll on this one. By the way, you're asking us if we'd be okay with that? That's the question. Do you support it? Uh, by the way, these are clickers that have clicked in that I've recorded an uh, entry for, but still have not been registered. That is registered your name, so I don't know who you are when you're clicking into one of these. You can do it on Blackboard. Okay, everybody done? Alright, so one person is in favor of this, 10 are opposed. I want to ask you, those 10 of you who are opposed, what's the problem here? Yeah. It wouldn't actually increase utility. We would all live in constant fear of being swept up in the middle of the night. And to have a night like this in society would overall actually decrease utility, I believe. So you are thinking, well, if you are sleeping in the middle of the night and at any moment I might be captured in order to um, be killed in order to have my well, so that fear might, de might decrease your level of utility. True enough, it might. On the other hand, on the other hand, what are the odds that you will be swept up and killed and to have, and have your organs harvested? I don't know, whatever they are, there's some probably a pretty low percentage. Still a lot more than if this didn't exist, though. It wouldn't stop me from being awake all night, no matter how low percentage it is. Uh -huh. But are night. you awake all night fearful that you might develop a disease that needs an organ donation and there won't be anybody to give you that donation? Because it's five times more likely that that'll happen than you'll be captured. So if you're afraid of being the one who's forced to make a donation to save the other five, you should be five times as fearful that you're going to be one of the five that doesn't get an organ. Because there are five times as many people who are going to be saved by this policy than will be killed by this policy. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't agree because any kind of, we know that certain things can make you unhealthier, like smoking lots of cigarettes, drinking all the time. So, I mean, unless there's some kind of qualification process, it seems like anyone can do whatever they want, knowing that, oh, there's probably someone who will help me out eventually. Yeah, like, it, it's a value, there's no room for, that's always on the common utilitarianism, but there's really no room for um, circumstantial 
qualities of the situation. Like, what if the person that you're giving an organ, one of the people that you're giving an organ to, that you just got killed with your organs to, has like, see, yeah, cystic fibrosis. Like, okay. you're gonna probably die anyway. Cystic fibrosis, you're probably going to die anyway. Okay, so we can modify the proposed law. So we can say that we'll only capture people in order to save people who have been responsible, people who haven't. Yeah, well, that's not irresponsible either if you are like having degenerative disease. No, this, was, this was the case before. Somebody who they won't have, uh, that, is the, that this policy will, in effect, offer an, an incentive for people to drink and smoke, knowing that there is the fallback. There's going to be an ambulance come out to save them. And so, but we can modify this proposal, right? So that, so that it's not going to it's not going to save those individuals. Yeah. What about if uh, you got a deadly virus and no one's going to want your organs? If you see the ambulance coming, you just have like HIV needle. Be like, prick, that you don't want me anymore, do you? I just got another year out of this. Okay, well, so there might be some perverse incentives here. <laughs> but somehow, that I don't think is capturing what most of you are objective to this. I mean, I want to say, I want to say again, if you are fearful of being the one, you should be five times as fearful of being one of the five. Net, this is going to save lives. I'm objected to it because I think that you are valuing almost everybody's life and purpose on this planet the same, and that's not at all how I feel about people. Well, look, so <laughs> that, now that's absolutely right. That utilitarianism says that what counts from a moral point of view is well, life or happiness or the satisfaction of preferences or whatever it is, impartially considered, impersonally. Impersonally meaning, uh, as I said, I think last time, human beings on this view are, as it were, simply the location for the goodness, the good stuff, the valuable stuff, pleasure, happiness, life, whatever it is. So there's a kind of sense in which people aren't being respected at all. Their level of happiness or pleasure or something is from an impartial point of view. That's precisely why, in an example like this, a utilitarian is going to allow uh, the sacrifice of one individual to be compensated for by gains to others. So maybe we think, I think, that from a moral point of view, we can't be just indifferent to whose happiness or whose life it is. <clears throat> the experiments like this for sacrificing people for other people are always used to object to utilitarianism. Yeah. But I think any utilitarian would just say that those cases you're basically playing God. There's too many variables to keep track of. That it's utilitarian to just refrain from sacrificing or causing harm in cases like this because the consequences are so there's so many variables you can't actively predict. If you could if you could write a piece of paper, this would definitely increase utility. Yeah. If God came down and said this would do it, the utilitarian would say yes, do it. But in the real world, there's so many variables that it's better to just refrain from causing harm in that. Okay, so I, I actually agree that um, predictions of the consequences of one's actions ramify out in very unpredictable ways. But it seems to me that that's also an objection to utilitarianism. So utilitarianism is going to say that what we have to do, that, we, that what makes it right is the balance of consequences. But if we don't know that, then this makes utilitarianism inapplicable, a, a theory that we can't really use. But that would just throw all actions into doubt. The that's right. No, that's right. So day. from a utilitarian point of view, that throws all actions into doubt. That's, what, that's, that's what I'm saying is an objection to utilitarian, but we still act. We still we're not going to say we should just slide that and never act. That's right, but you're, con you're confident, for some reason, that if we don't know all of the manifold consequences of our actions, what we should do is not cause harm. 
But why are you confident that that's what will maximize utility? Because I think there's a certain level of certainty that you can reach in which case you want to act. Um, but in, case, in cases where it's just too many variables to reach a level of certainty, you should refrain if acting would you know firsthand cause this utility. So this we know would cause this utility to people firsthand. You can't say with a certain level of certainty that would cause overall utility. We can say with overall certainty that it'll increase in it'll increase the number of lives. Yeah. So as far as we can tell, this will have a net increase. Okay. Um, So Kant is going to say that um, that so Kant is going to reject the teleological theory. That means he denies that there is a premoral good that's to be maximized by all moral actions. He's going to deny that all moral actions aim at the same end. Um, and therefore, he's going to say that we cannot simply evaluate the sorry, we cannot evaluate the morality of an action simply by looking at its consequences. We cannot evaluate the morality of an action simply by looking at whether it promotes, as an outcome, some good that we can identify in pre-moral terms. On the other hand, very often people say that. Well, if Kant is not a consequentialist, he must not be concerned with consequences at all. And I think that's very misleading. So I will try to identify the points in Kant's theory where, as it were, consequences matter, even if they're not the only thing that matters from a moral point of view. Okay. Um, so, we have time to get started talking about um, Kant and a little bit about his life. Okay, so he lived from 1724 to 1804. He lived virtually all of his life in Königsberg, um, what's now Kaliningrad, in what was then East Prussia. So here's Europe. Here's the great country of Latvia. Latvia here. Um, you see Poland here. Uh, sorry, you see Russia over here. So here, this little bit. Uh, on the Baltic Sea, this area here between Poland and Lithuania. Um, this is actually today still part of Russia, even though it's not contiguous. And you see Kaliningrad here. And that's the city that was formerly known as Königsberg. So that's the city where Kant spent um, his entire life. Um, it was, uh, because it was a trading port, it was, um, uh, it had t international ties. And so there was, um, um, there were connections to uh, England, um, and it was the administrative center of East Prussia. But on the other hand, it was not a cosmopolitan city like London or Paris. It was sort of on the outskirts of Europe. During World War II, uh, the city was virtually destroyed um, and was rebuilt primarily as a Soviet naval base. Um, and as I said, it's now Kaliningrad. It's part of Russia, um, even though it's not contiguous with the rest of Russia. Uh, he was the fourth of nine children. He never married, although he got engaged twice. Both times he postponed the wedding, claiming that he didn't have... Uh